Welcome to the Pendulum Insight Podcast. This is a show for deal makers in the blockchain business, where we meet the players who are changing the game today and get their insight into everything from the red tape to the raise. This is your host, Colton Moffitt. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Today we have Ben Leff of Leff Ventures. Uh, ben and I actually met in a 10X Factory, which is a Slack community. And there are not a lot of people that are interested in blockchain or crypto stuff there. But when you find somebody who is, it's always nice to connect. Um, and having done so, we've had some great conversations. And it's been fun to learn about what Ben's working on. So Ben, why don't you tell us more about yourself and kind of what you've done in the space, where you came from, and what Leff Ventures is all about? Sure, Colton. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And yes, like you said, it's always great to meet someone enthusiastic uh, in the industry and share ideas and, and, and be here today to talk about uh, blockchain industry in general. And, and like you asked, what uh, Left Ventures is all about. And I'll start very briefly. You know, it kind of summarizes my crypto history, if you will, as a professional. Um, um, it's very very community driven, very social driven at the time. A lot of my work, my expertise provides around social media management, community management, um, ambassadorships for different ICOs, um, and, and general growth building of campaigns and marketing. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing now uh, in the industry, at least from a strategic, uh, perhaps even social or partner or ship standpoints, is um, a lot more companies are beginning to network from a strategic standpoint. And I know we're gonna get into strategic partnerships. That is a big buzzword in the crypto industry nowadays. But for me, it's not so much business to business anymore. It could be person to person, um, making that one connection click that really is gonna help drive a team, a project, an idea forward to the next step. That's what yeah. Left Ventures is all about. That's excellent. So then why don't you just um, elaborate on that for us a bit in terms of where you see things going, you know, the blockchain ecosystem going into 2019, as you said, strategic partnerships being kind of a buzzword. That's great news for me uh, because <laughs> I was looking for an industry to apply it to and um, to see it catching on that people are valuing this in, in the blockchain space is great because for a lot of late 2017 and early 2018, it was more of your traditional digital marketing um, approach because they were going after retail investors. So tell me, tell me where you see yourself and Left Ventures fitting into that pattern going into 2019. So of course you can't, um, you can't ignore or exclude any of the traditional marketing approaches or the, I uh, would even say venture raises nowadays that, that some companies are doing. With that being said, there are some new approaches um, to do, to do the business more efficiently, I would say. And uh, with that, like I said, it's moving more into the, to the networking side. So to give an, a, an idea or an example of strategic partnerships and why I think they're valuable is, is very much why I believe it you know, takes a team to, to win a game, it takes a team to raise a family, things like that. It's very much a collaborative effort. Um, the bl blockchain to me, a lot of people, a question asked for a lot of people is, why did you get into the blockchain industry? And, uh, People say, well, it's the future, things like that. It's uh, the technology of the future will help shape the 21st century. I believe um, a major part of it is a tool that is going to connect people all, all around the world. It's going to maximize globalization uh, mm -hmm. in a social way. And being able to do that on an individual network as well as a business network using strategic partnerships. Um, now that you see that a lot with ICOs right now, they're trying to work together to combine the, their multiple products or product suites um, in order to best serve one another, kind of con uh, consolidating the competition there and turning it into something a bit stronger, more robust, especially in this bear market. So yeah. that's, that's what I believe. Uh, that's where I believe these um, partnerships are headed. It's where I believe the industry can move to in a, I wouldn't say safer, but perhaps a more um, thought driven environment where you're collaborative with your uh, strategic partners, you have a lot more input with the community, and from that, you can make your product and your project a, a better, um, a better one and a success. Hmm. That's good. You know, that's um, something interesting to see is gauging the extent to which current partnerships that we see announced are um, actually 
combining services, combining products, research and development, or they're actually entering new markets versus I think early on, some of it was just kind of logo swapping, um, which there's, there's cross promotion is a great place to start, but it will be interesting to see how deep those partnerships go, um, verging on to acquisitions. I've been seeing a lot of that in the space too, partnerships that are turning into acquisitions after some time. Absolutely. And I agree. I believe you have to really kind of weed out what's fluff out there. You know, why are these companies teaming up uh, with, with one another? There, there has to be some value on, on both ends. So, yes, uh, there, there is some of that cross-marketing, cross-promotion going on. Um, and again, the swapping of logos. Um, and you have to just be vigilant and uh, look for the very good strategic partnerships that seem to make sense to you. If it doesn't make sense uh, in a utilitarian way or in some type of logical way it's probably just for fluff that's all yeah. i have to say about that yeah and again i mean if you're listening now um and you've and you've done a logo swap type of thing or just a quick um cross promotion email list telegram spam whatever um it's okay it's definitely yeah. it's a starting point and it's how you can kind of develop a bit of trust but it is good from the perspective of the user or the client to see that there is an increase in the value or the quality of whatever service or product or that um, from the investment perspective that there's actually, you know, it's a more profitable enterprise and more efficient at that. So uh, you've got an interesting take on volatility. You know, you've got a background in oil and gas. So tell us how your background shaped your attitude toward those kinds of volatile trends in blockchain space. Well, when uh, when entering the oil and gas industry, I thought I was was going to be in the most one of the most volatile industries in the world until crypto came around. Uh, I guess something about me naturally seeks instability. And um, what I find interesting about the volatility um, driven in crypto and blockchain, especially right now, a lot of it seems to be sentiment based. Maybe that's because a lot of my my job is um, with various clients and um, in the community is, is front facing, talking to people and, and seeing, you know, what the, what that pulse is like right now. Mm -hmm. What are people doing? Where are they spending their time? What are they, what are they researching? Are they, are they investing? What's happening? And I think technical analysis from your standard perspective, your Wall Street is important, of course, but, but crypto to me is such, such a more socially driven, all of them, all of the projects are, are impacted um, by, by social media and the community at large. And that's why I believe that the volatility in the market is very much a sentiment driven piece. Mm. There's a fairly direct relationship between PR and, and price and these kinds of Situation. The, the correlation is scary, and I would I would like to see a, a breakaway, and I think I think that is happening. And and like you said, and like we both said about these strategic partnerships, it is necessary in the beginning, uh, in order to, to 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 gain some traction and such. But but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, and and move forward to make a better product for all. Yeah, that's that's very important. I mean, look at the difference between traditionally the idea of the differences anyway between technical analysis and fundamental analysis. Um, you have now where people are going into the kind of digital securities where they're acknowledging it's a security, you know, STOs, and there's right. a couple other acronyms floating around. So that's where you're looking at some pretty serious fundamental analysis. You have accredited investors or, you know, people that are coming from that background, capital markets background, looking for solid business opportunities and fundamentals that are actually going to stand up to some scrutiny. It's going to be a lot harder now for even a cryptocurrency project, which is not a security, you know, to go and, and get through the kind of hype cycle as fast as some of them did before. And I'm not the kind of person and I'm not going to say there's no need for cryptocurrencies and everything is a, a security or there's no need for utility tokens. I think they'll all fit in somewhere, but you have to be ready for there to be a much more skeptical public and more skeptical investment community. 
I agree. And it, it's funny is this, this industry was born um, out of the idea of no regulations or little regulations and decentralization. We're seeing, of course, with the, with the number of ICOs that end up being scams or, or failures that perhaps a, a modicum of regulatory authority might not be a terrible thing. And so you're getting these split offs, like you said, your security, your STOs, your ICOs, things like that. And it is going to reshape the way traditional investors enter the market. And I think that's a good thing because we need to gain mass adoption. I don't care what what coin, what blockchain, what token you support or believe in. If people don't believe in the underpinning technology of blockchain um, and want to adopt that into their own business, into their own life, uh, then uh, the idea of you know, utilizing any one or multiple cryptocurrencies or tokens to uh, obtain or I would use them as a payment system or as a utility token, it, it wouldn't work on a mass setting. So again, I think bringing in those extra the set of analysis, the extra set of eyeballs, perhaps even the regulations of security tokens will be scrutinized and fall under to the SEC uh, will be a good thing in the future. I agree. There's uh... I think it was just a bit of miscommunication, sometimes intentional, sometimes completely um, benign. And that was, you call something that is basically crowdfunding. You call it an ICO, frankly, because it sounds like IPO, it sounds like an important way to raise money, right? You know, just Correct. the kinds of connotation. But then they're backpedaling now and saying, wait, it's a utility token. Like, then why are you selling it as a, the way you'd sell a security? As you said, Bitcoin, okay, Bitcoin as a currency, as a payment uh, processing system, you know, as a network, that was not going to run afoul of securities laws, really. It, it would have been fine. If it was just Bitcoin, everything was fine, in my opinion, though, okay? But really, where you run into now regulators care is because of ICOs, because somebody had this brilliant idea, um, and hats off to them. Then regulators like, well, now you're, you're basically selling security. So... Uh, we, we, so to speak, you know, collectively brought it on ourselves. Brought it on ourselves, 100%. I, I agree. You, you have too much freedom in any marketplace, essentially. A few bad actors are going to come in and cause a lot of change. Um, and it'll end up for the better in the long run. But uh, as we've seen in 2018, it's been a, a bearish year. And I think a very, a very big reason around that is not purely around token price, but all, all around regulations and speculation, which mm -hmm. have yet to be put in place in, in major sectors such as the United States. Right. Well, and, and also, of course, the macro macroeconomic situation globally, geopolitically, um, that's it's hard done. to separate it. Because when you're neck deep in the blockchain space all the time, it's kind of like you're looking for a reason, some kind of reason to blame, single causation. But then you look and the entire global market is behaving in a similar way. All right. Maybe we're not that special yet. It's, it's not and one and one and some people ask me, you know, well, you know, Ben, shouldn't crypto be doing much better than standard markets right now with with the way that, uh, you know, the world shaping up and the, 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 the economy is looking towards the end of the year. And, you know, I, of course, I'm not an economist, but my answer very much is no, because we're equally as impacted uh, for ge geopolitical events as traditional markets. Right. I would say we're even more impacted because of the hyper volatility and the emotional nature of our investors. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely a high risk appetite and people who are tending to be a bit um, not entirely anti-system. I mean, you have some very traditional finance guys in there now, but fundamentally, philosophically, as you said, it's more or less anti-authoritarian. So, of course, it's an interesting mix. Fascinating interviews lately. Um, spoke with Jared Johnson from BlockRig, and he had some similar points about, sure, philosophically, if we could have things our way, if we're just talking about how things could be over a couple beers at the bar, then it's, that's great. But when you start taking money from people, institutions, venture capitalists, private equity, hedge funds, everybody gets involved, they're not going to be okay with just an IOU and a smile. You know? So right. we're dealing with their, um, you know, let's just look at STO or digital securities in general. That's one application of blockchain to a particular part of a certain industry. And they want that regulation that they've had. So more power to them. 
Absolutely. And, and you're, you're hundred percent correct. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the, the theoretical, you know, conversation that you can have. I, I had it as recently as you know, yesterday evening talking about digitizing my friend's um, music and, and or decentralizing it and, and distributing it across, uh, you know, a blockchain for people to, for music projects that don't want to go on Spotify or Pandora and things like that. But at the end of the day, that's much more difficult to implement when you start getting these major players who want to get their royalty fees and things like that paid out. So there are other factors that, um, when as as crypto projects become more mainstream more integrated into the real world they're going to have to find a way to work with existing um markets uh either either by mergers and acquisitions or by having a a degree of separation i suppose as to how they go about doing business but they will have to somehow or another come to some kind of adherence with one another it's going to be very interesting when uh, people are going to have a choice to go essentially do I want to do something an entirely decentralized way or would I like to go ahead and do it the normal route? And I, I see that in the future as, as being a very real possibility of having two totally different options to obtain the same goal. Yeah, absolutely. Even take the case of Bitcoin, for instance, and it not being anonymous and people saying, well, we should make it more private versus no, it needs to not be that way. We can actually use it in uh, the rest of the world and use it for payments. Um, but there's still Monero. You know, there's still all kinds of products. There's really no right. limitation. Cat's out of the bag. I mean. Right. Why change the, the original, you know, right. plans of Bitcoin when there are already projects that have accomplished this? Exactly. And it's, of course, a useful opportunity. But as you said, I mean, you were talking to your friend about putting his music on a blockchain and, and decentralizing it. And as a musician, if his priority is ownership, his priority is getting paid a certain way or not having his music under the control of these kind of centralized organizations, then that could be really interesting to him. But if his priority is getting people to listen to the music, then then we got a little bit of time before we can forego those platforms. Right. Exactly. How do you get people to listen to music right now in, in that, in that type of environment, how do you disrupt that industry? So it's very fun to have those theoretical conversations. And I hope that, that we do see some, some big plays work out in, the, in different sectors like that, which I'm sure will come. Yeah. Well, you know, and let's give some credit to the, the people who made those things like Spotify and those various other options. Absolutely. Because it was record industry for decades before that. So a hundred percent Spotify and Pandora were the solution to radio, you know, and everybody were extremely happy, was extremely happy with that. So yeah. I, I just see it as, as further evolution. And these, these guys are pioneers in their industry. And of course I, I listen to both. I love them both, but I'd love to see more options, especially in a decentralized world. Mm -hmm. And for people to be able to uh, take a song and use it in a video or in a video game or whatever, and for the creator to get paid. That'd be Absolutely. To cut, to cut out all that extra royalty fees that people are going to have to pay and bring it straight back to the content creator so that they can continue to push out new and, and fresh content. Be great. Yeah. I think that'd be great too for games that have um, modding communities or level design, all that stuff. So Absolutely. tell us what you're working on now. You know, you've given us the kind of high level overview. <laughs> You've got some interesting projects underway. Sure. So um, the biggest project, the most exciting one that I'm working on now is, is one called, called Goldilocks um, Security. Well, it's just called Goldilocks, but it is a, a security, um, I would call it a security protocol, perhaps a security layer. What it is, it's a remote um, automated air gap storage system. So, and it's, uh, it, it, it was conceived out of the idea of, is cold storage really, the safest way to do things can can it be hacked and the answer is yes um can, can anything be hacked uh, probably yes um, i'm not perfect uh, I, I don't think there's an unhackable system out there i'm i'm, I'm sure but uh, when i went to work with goldilock one of the things that we spoke about in the very beginning um from a community management perspective i was asking them several several uh, questions as far as who their core customers would be um the principles behind the technology things like that and what I found fascinating is the use case for retail users and for businesses. Um, it was kind of in the middle of uh, July, of course, a very bad time of the year. It just got, did nothing but get worse. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think they did, which is very smart on their end, something very unique, is that they didn't hold, they, they, they decided not to hold an ICO, take that name away from the project. and. Um, 
and work on the underpinning technology. So they, they have an MVP out right now, um, and it's absolutely incredible. So picture your, your Google Drive or your iCloud or wherever you, you store files um, and you want to access them anywhere, and they have a dashboard for that that uses some really, really incredible technology, including um, it has the ability to do voice recognition, uh, several different layers of two-factor uh, two, two authentication, password entries and such. I can literally upload petabytes of information um, into their into their servers, which are located in vaults and mountains that they'll never tell anybody in undisclosed locations. I dial in a phone number, turns on, I access all my data, and then I can turn it off by calling in and using my specialized PIN code and, and, and voice um, recognition. Now, think about that from a from a logistics and supply chain standpoint, or simply just an informational standpoint. Being able to take so HIPAA compliance in the United States for your healthcare records and banking records, being able to take that data and securely store it offline rather than having your paper vaults or your digital filing systems right now, or, uh, you know, your EMRs, your electronic medical records are all stored in different programs. Mm -hmm. Those are all still live. They're online, they're in the cloud, um, and they're all able to be hacked um, as long as they're live and up online. So what this does is give you time critical access to the most important data that you need, and then you can cut it off, take it offline remotely um, without the interference of possibly a man in the middle attack um, or anything like that. And what I love is they've based it off the Neon wallet. So anyone out there that uses Neo and, and has a Neon wallet, they open it up and they have you know, two different dashboards. One's a digital asset dashboard where I can see all my files and folders that I've uploaded. And the other is a cryptocurrency wallet based on Neon, the, the Neo protocol, NEP5. Yeah. So anything on the Neo blockchain, they, they can support. And then, of course, they've got a real use case here um, as far as, you know, medical records, um, banking, um, anything, any sensitive information to be stored. Yeah. And what, what I really look for in projects now, because when I joined Goldilocks, they already had this, is do you have a working product? How far away are you from an MVP? When can you show the public something other than just um, an idea? And yeah. I asked them that question, they asked me, you know, do you have time to take a look at it now? So, you know, one thing, and I'm, I'm going to take a step back and sure. just say something about the markets is, you know, everybody, I think, can agree that um, ICOs are almost becoming a toxic term nowadays. But, but one thing about projects in general is, you know, if you're, if you're looking for a, a fundraise, you know, make sure you've got something um, on your books more than just marketing and ad spend. Make sure that you've got something perhaps tangible. Mm -hmm. And what I love most about the Goldilocks software is it's, it's there and it exists and they're taking their time doing it very strategically, um, not by forming strategic partnerships per se, um, just making sure the technology is robust and built out. And, uh, and finding the right players in not just the blockchain space, but also the traditional, the traditional companies um, that are going to be using these storage mechanisms mm -hmm. and implementing Goldilocks as a protocol layer. It's a super fascinating thing, and, and it's, it's one project that I absolutely love being a part of. Um, taking things to a whole different level there, and I'm not even part of the project. It's just it's, it's fascinating. I was listening to one of your earlier podcasts, mm -hmm. and... Uh, one of your guests brought up um, how much they love gamification on the blockchain and how, how, how much games, um, how you can do so much with, with different games and in, in the industry right now. Yeah. And it's becoming a huge market. Heck, take a look at Aventus. They, they were very actually successful ICO. Um, anyway, long story short, um, I am fascinated with some of these games there's one uh, called Ether Kingdoms, for example, that has implemented uh, a POS system inside of a game. So you're actually playing and mining and building a kingdom. But when you're mining in the video game, you're, you're actually doing proof of stake mining by holding <laughs> their tokens. And it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a stupid little gimmicky thing, but it's, it's enjoyable because it, it's got a little bit of depth to it and they're adding more to the game as, as, it, as it goes along, but it, it goes to show that even just the littlest bit of utility keeps someone interested in the product and, and, and the project. Right. And 
either kingdom is, is, is a very exciting one for me, but from a, from a practical, from a use case standpoint, uh, the Goldilocks security layer, I mean, you look at all these hacks and ICOs that I've even been a part of um, were hacked. And um, it is uh, a travesty. You see the, the money just, it, it just vanishes. The token price gets obliterated and it turns, turns into vapor overnight. So to me, security is, is, is absolutely necessary. That's why I joined the Goldilocks project and that's why I'm dedicating a lot of time to it. Mm. Absolutely. That's uh, the feeling of just kind of horror of watching that happen and having to go tell everybody um <laughs> crazy um, yeah I'm, I'm shaking my head right now yeah the uh one of the icos i worked with uh with the ceo's phone um was sim swapped twice oh, actually god and yes it was a horrible uh experience for all for the team members for the community for the project it uh it was just devastating um, yeah and this is a project that that had technology behind it and and had a product and it's still you know when that came in it, it the first thing it brings to mind is security what are your what are your sops on security and i think that's something that's very important in this world is all these companies raising millions hundreds of millions of dollars in total how are you securing your funds to make sure that your that your clients investments are safe your customers investments are safe so um, it'll be interesting to see how these that this shakes up because you know I think a lot of a lot of the failure, um, and when I say failure, um, I simply mean projects that are falling apart yeah. based on things outside of their own control, like the market. Maybe they're not managing the money correctly. So I, I'm interested to see to cut two things in the future. Number one, how are you going to securely store any digital you know asset that comes in or any piece of information that comes in and keep everything safe for your project and you know number two how how are you going to implement it in such a way that um you know it's easily adoptable by all and it's it's able to be taken to um both institutions and individuals to to better number one secure your funds from the standpoint of Goldilocks, and number two the transparency of for, for use of funds. I know everybody has, sees, has white papers and stuff like that, but I'd like to see a little bit more of that when, when, in, within these projects that are coming out and saying, look, you know, the funds raised here, you know, X, Y, Z proceeds will go to this portion of the project. Yeah. Um, a lot of roadmaps are really just that. And, and it's just, you know, it's something that they say they may or may not follow. And, um, I'm just looking forward to seeing a lot of these companies actually produce the products that they say that they're, they're raising funds for. Yeah. What was the, um, the statistic? It was something like 85 or 90% of ICOs were considered scams. 90, 93%. I'm, I find it a bit dubious. I mean, okay, there's gotta be some that outright intentionally scams people. And then there gotta be people who kind of got in over their heads or and then in the middle ground, people who had good intentions and then, you know, things fall apart. If you've ever gone into business with a friend or something um, in your life and it goes fine uh, for a while and a couple months in, things start cropping up and like, ah, it's my friend, it'll be okay. Something that started out with the purest of intentions and the highest hopes can very quickly become something that puts a chill on a friendship for years. So absolutely. So something absolutely. Been when you hand someone like here's 15, 20 million dollars uh, in BTC or ETH or whatever, have fun with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and even, even working out in the, going back to the, to the partnership level from a business perspective. Yeah. But when you do a, you know, when you're borrowing from one of your strategic partners or when you're working together, but you know, you suffer a hack or something happens negatively in your community that directly impacts their project. How, you, how do you recover from that? You, you simply, yeah. you know, you're going to have to work through it and trudging through the mud is, I, I think it's something that we've all done in the crypto space at this point uh, in our careers. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be beyond it sooner than later. Yeah. Well, you know, even with uh, traditional venture capital models, which are, again, it's a fairly young, way of doing business relative to, you know, human history, there's still 90% failure rates or more worse in a lot of cases. So it's, it's a matter of being realistic about what we can expect. Part of the massive amount of hype that has happened over the past year and a half 
is that people sometimes I think forget the reality of all enterprise is that most of the time it fails. Mostly. It's good when it doesn't. That's why those get in the news because they are rare. Exactly. That's what hits the news, right? Is when they succeed. So you think that everything's a success. Right. And I guess that's called survivorship bias. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, you mentioned that uh, your greatest strength is finding opportunities and people and companies pairing them, you know, especially if you know that they would form a great, useful, practical partnership. Uh, how did that strength develop? And when did you first notice you could do it better than most people? Um, well, I, I, I didn't, uh, I wouldn't say I found it as a strength um, when I was in high school, but I was always in student government um, up through, you know, class presidents in high school and through, through college even, um, debate teams, things like that, uh, Model UN. Uh, so I've, I've always been been interested in people, um, not so much maybe the, the political issues per se, but the way people um, react and adapt to said issues. Mm. And so um, that really fascinated me in college. Uh, I, I ended up majoring in political science. And um, <clears throat> so, excuse me. So one thing that um, I found as far as my, uh, my strengths go and networking is people come to you they're typically pitching an idea they're they're trying to obtain something um it's it's not out of it, it's not always out of greed it's not always out of some uh, dubious means some people are often coming to you for help uh i say you as the general public maybe they're coming to you because you're a subject matter expert mm -hmm. and and that being said what what i like to do most is um, listen to the idea, listen to the project, and and ask them very very frankly, what's your biggest pain point right now? What if you could overcome anything, a hurdle of any kind? What would that be? Um, I take that information and I kind of mull it over a, a bit between what I've what I've they've told me and what I know about the project, and then who else do I know that's that's in the industry or trying to get into the blockchain industry or even traditional markets and, 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 and sectors who can help. And I found that putting together a network, building um, a group of people empowers more than just those two people that you're putting together. It empowers the project. It empowers the community. It makes everything just a little bit better, it makes everything easier when you have the resources, the knowledge, and the network to get it done. So I really started to find that out in my, uh, I would say, early professional years. Um, as I was uh, working in oil and gas, I moved more into a sales capacity and found that um, you know, understanding the needs of people is really what I was best at um, as a salesman. And I realized you don't have to be selling anything to to help an individual who has needs. You just need to be able to um, find someone else who's able to compliment them and get that accomplished. And I've always, um, at this point, I, I pride myself on, on being able to do that on a pretty regular basis, whether it's fundraising, PR, social media, marketing, um, all the way to technical writings and analysis. You just have to reach out and in this area, especially in the blockchain space, uh, trust you have to know where to go the, the correct resources and and really vet the people that you keep closest to you that you want to work with mm -hmm. and and make sure that you're all aligned uh, in a vision when when these opportunities arise absolutely trust is key uh, it's key in any capacity but you know i i would bet there's at least one or two cutthroat players in the baked goods industry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as, aside from, from all that, I mean, it is definitely a fascinating environment to work in because I was just talking, um, one of the guests recently had just this incredibly elaborate scam that these people tried to pull, you know, and they went and met them in person and very quickly had a bad gut feeling about it. But, you know, it, it was very, flashy polished and we were discussing just how some of the smoothest white collar criminals in the world just gravitated immediately to this once the hype kicked in and why wouldn't they i mean it's a gold mine for that so it makes sense but as you talked about earlier it doesn't have to happen to you 
your team could be rock solid from a due diligence perspective, but then you go and you do this partnership with another company and you can get contaminated by somebody that they hired. And so you're now two steps removed and still you're getting the, the consequences. So what's that like for you when it comes to due diligence or it comes to figuring out who you can trust the people are listening right now. What's a tip you could give them? So, you know, guys don't, don't hate me for saying this. Uh, do your own research first. <laughs> uh, now, now that being said, obviously, you know, the, the power of, of, of networking or, or really working with people and, and, and understanding their needs. It's not something that everybody is able to just say, Hey, what do you need and how are we going to help and how are these partnerships going to work together? So, what I would say, if, if you are in the business of, you know, looking to partner with someone, um, you know, there are a couple of key things. First of all, there's nothing like a good old fashioned face to face meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I know uh, nowadays, as, as, as you know, globalized as the world is, sometimes everything's done digitally. But I can tell you that um, I myself have, have, you know, had multiple meetings over, you know, the computer or the phone. And when you get uh, to meet in person, something just doesn't feel quite right. Like you had prior, previously discussed things like that. So to me right now, there's still no substitute for that old, old fashioned one-on-one -on -one get to know somebody. Now, if that's not um, an option for you for geographic purposes or, or whatever, if you can't, you know, physically meet one thing that I'm, that I'm always doing is researching where, you know, the project that I'm on, use that for an example, if I'm on a project and we're yeah. seeking out a strategic partnership, um, I'm looking for a couple of things. Number one, I'm looking for a team with a proven background. So the individuals themselves, I'm going to be reaching out to them um, on, on behalf of my client. So I'm going to reach out to the individuals of each team and they it can, it can be a mixed response. Sometimes you'll, you'll kind of get a generic, um, yes, we all want to do this and, and they'll, they'll come back and maybe one representative will speak on behalf of the entire team. Other times you kind of get this disparate, um, sector of, or section of ideas from people, which is a red flag for me. If your own team can't tell me what you all are trying to accomplish, um, yeah. or if you all have different visions inside, uh, of your organization, it means you're not driving towards, you're not on the same you know, path. And, and that's a big red flag for me. And, and, a, and a quick way to, to, to figure that out is to speak to the team members themselves if you have the opportunity. If you don't, you know, of course, do your research on their website, to go read their white paper. And at the end of the day, um, me being in, in community management, social media management, go see what their sentiment is like, get in the telegram, go look at their Facebook, ask people, ask your friends if they've ever even heard of these guys that you're researching. Right. And if it would, if it would be a good fit, um, you can never ask too many questions. So the one piece of advice I would leave is you could never ask too many questions. And if someone is hesitant to answer one that you need, that, that you know, that is important to you, stick with your gut. Mm. And I'll stay at that. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, you know, as far as the sticking to your gut thing goes to, particularly if you had a bad gut feeling at first, then definitely stick to that. One thing I have noticed as well is, um, some of the people listening now that know that I worked as a PI and in this time I learned to also question my gut feeling when it's positive. So if I assume uh, that that's okay, there's nothing wrong there that can actually get in your way too. So double check too, you know, trust, but verify, trust your gut, all of the, the normal advice, but actually follow it because yeah. when it comes to it, it can be very easy to gloss over something. And that's actually how your run of the mill con artist or, or your person who's very adept at it. Their whole objective is to get you to like and trust them first before they ask you to do anything. And that, that can be one of the most dangerous things is, you're looking for some clear and obvious red flag when what you should be looking for is inconsistencies. And the second you notice an inconsistency, like Ben just described different agendas or even different interpretations of a goal between team members or what they say versus what's happening in their telegram. And the people are saying there any inconsistency whatsoever needs to be asked about in a way that will open up a conversation about it. 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, again, yeah, the inconsistency is like, that, that's the biggest red flag. So, mm. you know, ask as many questions as I can and, and, and trust your gut. And, and <laughs> like you said, you know, question yourself sometimes, wear that tinfoil hat. You can never be too cautious <laughs> in this industry. Yeah. You know, it's okay. Everybody in this industry has got a tinfoil hat somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. They're better safe than sorry, really. I mean, there will be more projects. There will be more investments. There will be more. Just uh, don't For hit sure. back into something you're not sure of. So you've done a good bit of traveling, Ben. You've been out to uh, Vietnam. You've been around the U.S. attending blockchain-related events and, and so on. What's the number one thing you've learned from that experience so far? So one thing I've learned, um, my experience in Vietnam was 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 very incredible. Uh, first, the the burgeoning um, interest uh, in crypto uh, in that specific country is is, is fascinating. Um, people are working on projects left and right. There are some major exchanges based out of there. Um, you look at Liquid Exchange, one of their the largest in the world. One of their headquarters is uh, is, is is in uh, Ho Chi Minh, um, where I had the pleasure of visiting. Um, one thing that I see, uh, especially um, amongst all these communities, um, they are very, very, very protective of themselves, their projects, and um, you know, looking out for for scams. So, when I entered uh, the industry last year, no one was even talking about scams. That wasn't even something that came up. ICOs were just a great way to invest. Uh, and diversify your portfolio. Mm. And attending several, you know, blockchain exhibitions over the past year, um, being, going to Asia, Europe, things like that. Um, what people are most interested in that I find is um, they really want to convey the sincerity, the truth, the message behind their project, and get it out there in a mainstream manner. It's it. it it's, it's far less now about fundraising as it is about trust and project awareness. And it's funny, I was watching a podcast from a guy named uh, Crypto Har Harvey, and he was, I, I was speaking with him at the um, Blockchain Expo in uh, Chicago back in August. Yeah. And he actually mentioned this in his podcast is a lot of people that were in attendance were just walking around with business cards trying to sell things. Um, I was walking around to the different booths and to the different to the different lectures, and what a lot of people were really talking about the the biggest thing out there is, you know, how can we help each other? How can we how can we help make this space safer? How can we give it a better name? And 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 really, it, it comes back to all the, the the projects and the partnerships. How can we work to take this? nasty vibe in the air out of there a lot of it has to do with regulations a lot of it has to do with the scams or the failed projects and like you said that you, you have to take that 90 percent you know fail rate into account that happens in the real you know in the traditional world as well mm -hmm. so between all my travels what i've found more than anything right now is i call 2018 almost the year of the purge the year of the cleanup <laughs> People are people are really working to figure out what's most important to them in the blockchain space, where they want to not just put their money, but put their hearts. It's becoming split into verticals. You're getting full industries um, that are setting themselves up on the block on, on blockchains. Mm -hmm. uh, so what they're really doing is, is is trying to pick not even the winners, pick something that they believe in. Yeah. And, and back at 110%, bring it to life, bring it to fruition and implement that. One thing that I, I can say is I, everybody just wants to see, hey, here's my project and it'll be out then this date, great. Come talk to me when the project's out. Mm. And the biggest shift I've seen in 2018 is people, when they are making, an, whether they're making an investment or just an inquiry or they wanna learn a little bit more about um, let's step outside the actual coins or tokens and, enact, and, and talk about something tangible in a project is they want to see that product. And um, one thing is that, you know, it's something that's commercially viable or even simply if it's a social good project, mm -hmm. let us have a look at it. Let us put our hands on it. Let us, let us play with it, feel it, give us, a, you know, do some AB testing and, and let you know how it is because right now with, with all the, maybe not right now, but 
in February, March, April, when these raises were still, these companies were still getting 30, 40, 50 million dollars of yeah. USD equivalent, you know, there was still nothing um, in the back burn for a lot of these projects. So, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of this is cleared out. People are, are wanting to really reevaluate where they sit from an investment standpoint in their portfolios, what coins are going to shake out uh, if you're looking at it as an investor, if you're looking at it from, as, you know, from a project standpoint and, and build out, it's, you know, which ones are going to, are going to go on and grow. Who's going to, who is ahead of the regulations, who are going to survive the regulations, who are going to help, you know, change the system for the better. Yeah. That's something that I've seen, which is very different than the 2017 gold rush, so to speak, of here's a bunch of money. Let me invest in your ICO. Great. You've just 10x. I'll take my cash. I'm out. Thank you. Mm, right. So. And that is, you know, it's cool in a way what they were able to pull off. But on the other hand, right. <laughs> when you market something as a security and or the way that one would market a security and then a bunch of money is made that way and, and nobody wants to say pump and dub. Nobody wants to say it was fraud, you know, because it's like, Hey, it's new. It's blockchain. It's, it's okay. It's all right, guys. Well, you got some pretty angry people and they're calling their, you know, friends, cousin who knows the Senator or whatever. I mean, you piss people off and it's going to come back to bite you. So I am happy to hear what you're finding though, is that people are doing a, whoever's left a return to values, a return to a focus on, that's Correct. Cool. <laughs> you know, let's let's get let let's reshift what our expectations and 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 uh, are for this industry and apply that to 2019. Kind of start over from there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could say values and value. So you've got your integrity, you've got your honesty. Are you actually trying to do something good? And then there's value. Is there economic value to what you're doing? Whether that means as a profit making enterprise or as a um, a harm reducing project that's actually going to benefit people in, in a different way. So either way, that's economic value in my book. Absolutely. Social good or, or whether it be for the, you know, for capital, for the betterment of all is just as long as it, as it provides a better society, I think is what a lot of people are looking for at this point now in blockchain. I agree. So, you know, you've done some partnerships. I, I was looking into some of the info you shared with me and you have set up some great partnerships. Can you talk at all about those in, in, specific detail or do you need to change some names because the people sure, are no no not at all um so the one stuff. yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely um i was working on an ico uh called crowd machine and they uh did some uh strategic partnership the the one that uh really stands out to me the most um was with polymath um i think mm -hmm. many people are familiar with polymath now now back back then this partnership was announced i would say uh, maybe January, February of uh, this year it was very early on in the year, and um, Polymath was going to uh, white label some some of uh, their software by using Crowd Machine's um, application to develop it on, and everything lined up. The, the the visions that Polymath had for their software programs, their security tokens offerings, or, or rather their yeah, there's their security token portal, so to speak, or their ability to create security tokens for individuals or for companies. Um, all that stemmed, I, don't, I wouldn't say stemmed, but um, the partnership itself stemmed from their interest in white labeling the product um, and, and getting it out to other people. So Crowd Machine, what they brought to the table was something very unique, which is the ability to um, be blockchain agnostic and per, uh, create a zero code environment. So you don't have to be a developer to, to work on Crowd Machine's applications. A lot of it's drag and drop machine learning, uh, very intuitive. Mm. And um, that is accelerating the, um, or those developers that are using it are finding, you know, an accelerated growth rate for how they can get D apps on the market. Now, what we found great was, you know, um, a crowd machine before they were an ICO or before the crowd machine ICO uh, took place, they already had, uh, I believe three or five years of um, battle tested um, uh, in business um, 
enterprises and they took all that technology that they were using and they brought it into the crypto space and they brought it to these companies and the one company that really picked up on it more than anyone was polymath mm. they saw this developmental technology the ability to develop software and dApps up to 45 times faster as an, an incredible benefit for them um, with regards to launching their platforms, their offerings, and things like that. So uh, the original arrangement, the strategic partnership, that was was very interesting and very impressive was white labeling their software. So not only could they build it out for themselves, but they could also offer it to other partners. And Crowd Machine would be taking care of the development stuff on the back end, leaving Polymath resources to do what they do best, which is focus on security tokens. Mm. That's great. And so did you uh, facilitate an introduction there? Like how, how did you get that one moving? It, once the introduction was made, it was more of how the teams worked together mm -hmm. than anything like that. So my, my job there at Crowd Machine was director of community engagement mm -hmm. uh, as well as you know, social media and marketing. So a lot of what we did internally um, with the community is you know, work to with our strategic partners to develop our press releases, things like that, uh, come up with a marketing and campaign strategy, something that um, we're ready to show the general public and and really make sure not just that the message there is bold, strong and ready to be sent out, but that there's something robust for the punch. Uh, to me, that was always a product that always is and will be a product or something that you can, you know, really understand or a theory or concept that's that's just this close to coming to fruition and maybe they just need one little thing or two. Mm -hmm. And so once once the strategic partnerships were made, it was really a matter of aligning the message, making sure, like you said, it's it's two different ecosystems and you don't want to infect one with the other. And you can do that um, mistakenly, inadvertently. It could not, you know, totally not you know mean to do anything and at the end of the day some of your actions could negatively impact your partners so mm. there were there were two that, that that i found fascinating one was the polymath um uh, strategic partnership and another that i had a little more direct influence over was with a company called game loot network another um i was a director of internal uh, communications there um, they partnered with Crowd Machine in order to help um, build their decentralized gaming platform um, mm -hmm. using using Crowd Machine's um, applications, uh, D app building applications. Right. So you're always looking for that alignment. So what were people seeking out Crowd Machine for? Development. What was Crowd Machine Machine seeking people out for? They were they were looking for marketing, getting that name out there because what Crowd Machine's goal was uh, to bring development to the masses, make it very easily for people to code. However, you know, understanding that being a business, you have to have a revenue stream, revenue model, things like that. So yeah. making these alliances, these partnerships, and setting up some type of, of let's just call it you know successful capital path is going to come back and allow you to reinvest in your project and make it better for all and those were always the goals when we when we had these meetings when we had these strategic partnerships planned out and when we made these announcements and um in that particular case in those two particular cases it, it worked out great um there are several that i've done that have not and i am definitely a victim of of what i preach um which is you know do your own research uh, everybody's been burned by that before you know tr don't uh stick with your gut things like that you know that that yeah can come back to bite you so <laughs> long story short um you know there are great tremendous successes of the, the polymath and crowd machine um strategic partnership was really fantastic the game loot network and crowd machine strategic partnership was really fantastic um but at the end of the day if it doesn't make sense um then it's really not something that would be worth pursuing in my opinion mm. and i'm I'm very glad that these two in particular worked out um, because it, I'll tell you, uh, we went through a lot of trials and tribulations just to get through these strategic partnerships. We, we didn't want to do um, like you had stated and, and there's nothing wrong with it other than simply a lack of desire of logo swapping. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, really trying to find some partnerships that put utility behind both companies. Yeah. And even if you're doing this sort of thing as a third party or within one of the organizations, um, 
you obviously don't want to force a marriage where there isn't one to be had. Exactly. And at the same time, you don't want to go around on a bunch of blind dates. Uh, so you have to have that skeptical friend. If you're going to keep it in the, the dating metaphor for a moment, have that skeptical friend. It's like, you know, really that one or you know, have the person that you trust to say, Hey, look, I think you're being a little over optimistic or maybe you're being a little too hard on this other one. Run something by somebody else whose job it is, uh, to keep you a bit more objective or to feedback on what you're doing without necessarily making you feel better because that can be one of the worst things that gets preyed on unfortunately is feeling good about something and i have a mentor who taught me something very important which was that a lot of the people who fall victim to elaborate scams uh, over and over and over again are the kind of professional class or the new rich um, people who came into some money that they worked really hard for it, um, whether it's as an entrepreneur or to become a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, and they made some good decisions and they ended up with a, a bit of cash and they get targeted by people who prey on their insecurity about their qualification. And so essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase and oversimplify, but things like, you know, well, you seem like the kind of person that understands what we're trying to do here. Like you, you get it right. And then another one would be like, well, you know, if you can afford it or if this is something that you have the resources to take on and for someone that might've come upon those resources um, by, by a lot of hard effort there. And also if it's something that they believe is tied to their intellect, then it's something very easy to fall victim. Like, well, they said that I can, you know, if I could get the resources together or we could do this or, uh, they, you know, they complimented my intelligence or whatever, then it starts to get that ego moving. The social have, engineering. Yeah. Someone's got to check you and say, Hey, listen, what do you actually know about these guys? Have you seen a product? You know, have you even seen the bottle that the snake oil goes in? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Where's, where is the smoke that they're blowing coming from? So, right. So you have a, uh, you know, you say social engineering, you've got an interest in security. Um, I'd imagine you're kind of aware of that whole uh, security industry. So what do you find most concerning and risky about strategic partnerships and how has your interest in the kind of information security space uh, informed that? So what I find most risky about strategic partnerships, um, two things. Number one, from a regulatory standpoint, with without uh, getting into too much detail, um, two companies, one could be a, uh, a, have a token that's a utility, the other could have a token that's a security and you form a strategic partnership and all of a sudden you are totally clashing with regards to, to how your tokens are functioning on a marketplace or on an open exchange. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's something that you two are worried about as a company, um, you've, got to, you've got to set those expectations up beforehand. And what, what also really, really scares me um, about strategic partnerships is, um, and I'm going to try to take this outside of the ICO framework, when people are discussing their projects and they lay out a white paper or, a, or an idea for their project, they should be mentioning what it is they're looking for. They should have a weakness. If they're not doing a SWOT analysis and for those of you who don't know, uh, that's strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Mm -hmm. If they're not doing it on themselves, um, if they don't list at least one weakness, um, it's something that you need to be a little, that I'm a little wary of. And I'm going to ask that person, what, what is it that you all are having trouble with? Going back to, to the conversation I had, that's your weakness, whether or not they want to admit it or phrase it that way. And you can have that weakness preyed upon whether that be by a company that sees you having a tremendous, your company having a tremendous amount of value that you don't yet realize, like you were just talking on a one-on-one -on -one situation, um, or whether that weakness come from um, a vulnerability in, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing in this game. So if you don't iron out exactly what your needs are and exactly what your expectations are, the community will come back with a much, much, much bigger whip to crack than, <laughs> than your boss ever could. You know, when you've got tens of thousands of people who have invested in a project, all of a sudden see that you're deviating from the idea that they invested in because you're forming partnerships that don't make sense to them or ones that you never even announced or planned to do. Yeah. Um, 
it can be very scary in the industry for these people who said, well, look, I just gave you guys my money. And, and now all of a sudden it's being put towards this, the project X, Y, and Z. And that's not what I wanted. And so for me, of course, coming from a social media and community management standpoint, the blowback that you get from the general public can, can, can crush two projects at once, just, yeah. just, just doing it that way. So those are two things that I, that I worry about. Um, now, uh, your final question with you know, staying secure, things like that, that's, that's simply a matter of um, keeping that tinfoil hat on, <laughs> listening, to, uh, listening to podcasts, speaking to my friends in the industry, what are they doing um, in work to help keep themselves safe? This, is, this goes from everything from, from crypto wallets to what information do you put on your LinkedIn profile? Like be, you know, be careful, don't, just having your phone number up there could very easily make you a susceptible target. If you work, this is something I, I would uh, definitely like to pass on to people that might be working in, in sensitive mm -hmm. um, for uh, places or for companies that uh, have sensitive data. Don't post your location. Don't post the employer that you work for. If you are somewhere, do so afterwards, maybe. Um, you are a target um, in crypto. If you talk about having Bitcoin, if you talk about having any type of uh, cryptocurrency or, or bragging about anything in that realm, that's money to people's mind and it immediately makes you, makes you a target. So just be very careful. Number one, um, personally, when you're taking care of your own funds, how you manage them, who you're talking to about them, and what you're posting about uh, in, in a social media perspective. And secondly, from a business standpoint, um, just watch out for what could the blowback be from working with this company. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of great positives. There's, there could always be some negatives, but always make sure that the pros outweigh the cons. And and address those cons with your strategic partner or your potential strategic partner before you get into business with them. Sure. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. You know, what uh, the, the pros and cons dealing with assessing whether or not a partnership is worth it. You can't go it completely alone. You need customers, you need investors, you probably need partners of some kind, you know, look at the entirety of human existence. If you're by yourself in the wilderness, good chance you're going to starve to death. If you're with too many people in a city that's not well made, there's a you know, good chance you're going to get the black plague for a long time. So you've got to be in that middle ground and figure out what's right for you. And, you know, for, for the business that you're trying to build now right. from the security perspective, you know, you brought something to mind, which is if you're putting out there, you know, the location where you're working, there's sensitive data, there is a lot of wealth, which is in data form now, which was what we were all trying to make happen. But that, you know, that, that comes with working. Systems. Yeah, it works. It works. So the problem is if you don't want regulation or whether, whether you want it or not, it's catching up. Uh, the governments in general still don't give a rat's ass. If you lose your currency, they've never heard of and they don't even agree that it's a currency. There's not going to be a long line of law enforcement agencies lining up to help you. Um, you're not only a target, you're a ripe one and one that nobody's going to help. So <laughs> be careful. And if you're a business, if you're listening to this and you're actually, um, you know, you've got some resources because there's two ways to avoid being robbed. One is to be broke and the other one is to defend yourself, right? So right. if you're going to have that kind of publicity, you have to be public. Um, you know, I, people like to talk about stealth startups and all that, and that's lovely. But once it gets to a point where you're trying to make money, generally, unless you're doing government contracts, you're going hmm. to have a public profile. And in that case, have a budget for security. Security industry has been screaming about this for decades and no one listens, but please do. And it's, it, it, I agree. And, it, and it's everything. It jumps back to why I love the Goldilocks project so much because it's a technical security layer, but you know, that you, common sense is your first level of security and mm -hmm. you can't, you can't train it. You just need to be, to be wary, to, to just be a little bit cautious and to take everything with a grain of salt until you feel comfortable in that and, and moving forward with your business partner or with your strategic partner, uh, depending yeah. on the situation you're in. Err on the side of paranoia. Uh, of you know. course. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You know, some of my stupidest moments in life were, I thought to myself, the car is just going to be here for a minute. And oh, wait, I left my backpack in the front seat, backpack with, you know, computer, phone, everything that shouldn't have been there, notebooks. And 
you know, this is just a tiny example, of course. When I'm walking away from the car and I'm with my friend and I think, oh, he's going to think I'm just paranoid. If I'm like, wait, let me throw my backpack in the back. So I didn't say anything. And then we get back and the window's busted out and the backpack's gone. So that can happen to your business. Same thing. You just say, oh, I don't want to be weird. I don't want to make this weird. It's weirder when right. you're <laughs> I don't want to make a scene about it. Don't let me be the weird guy holding everyone else up at the party while I lock everything in the trunk of my car. But right. the night, everybody else's windows are busted out and mine are safe. Right. And you're not the one being like, hey, can I borrow your phone, stranger? Right. I swear <laughs> I'm not going to steal your phone. <laughs> right. Exactly. So don't go knocking on random doors. Exactly. Um, now, that being said, it's always good if, if you can make an introduction. Okay, this is not an overcommitment. You're not vouching for somebody's character. No, they're not going to be the godfather of your children. But if you can make an introduction that will help somebody and it's understood by both parties, like, hey, this is it's an intro. I um, hope it works out. Then that's not so bad, just as long as it's a bit of an implied disclaimer and you might need to be explicit about it in some cases. So in your case, if there is somebody listening right now who could introduce you to somebody, is there anybody in particular that you'd really love to meet up with or work with um, that maybe we could facilitate that intro? Now, would it have to be a person in particular or could I just give perhaps an idea? Of Profile in mind? Um, Profile would be I've fine. Asked, has just been very general about it. Nobody wants to be honest who they want to kiss. <laughs> but, well, you know, the person is interesting. It's not, it's not someone I would want to, uh, that I would be meeting for a business per perspective mm. as much as I want to ask what is going on in your mind and I'll just you know some of those people uh, I want to pick their brains whether I whether I believe in them or whether or not <laughs> let's talk to Roger Ver let's talk to Vitalik mm -hmm. understanding these people who um, can be very contentious in the space that that fascinates me that they, that, that that an individual's personality can cause so much contention mm. and truly a shift in markets so meeting and speaking to those people would 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 interest me on a personal perspective but yeah. um if there's anyone i'd love to meet up and work with right now the biggest thing for me um the, the most important thing that i think needs to be spread across this industry and we're going to go back to it is trust in a trustless system right now. So people who are working in security, people who are working on projects for social good, causes like that. Um, I'm not saying that if, if you're a if for-profit project that you're a bad project, there's seven, <laughs> absolutely not. I, I think it's great and more power to you. But what I'm most interested in right now is mass adoption of the blockchain um, mm. space and to really get to that level, uh, the people that you would want to meet aren't necessarily working on one particular project or two. They're more of blockchain evangelists, and they're just speaking about the technology as a good uh, technology to further implement and research in the future. So that would be the profile, so to speak. I don't know of anyone... Um, you know, of course, they, they say the claim Andreas Antonopoulos is not doesn't own a single Bitcoin, never has. And he's, a you know, just nothing but a, a fantastic mind. And that's wonderful. And I'd love to meet them. But I would, would would really like to meet people who are doing things in this space to make it safer, to mm -hmm. make it more accessible by the masses and to make it easier to understand um, on a layman's terms. That, that's on a layperson's terms. That's the easiest way to put it. I think a lot of saying the word Bitcoin and blockchain to people who have just never heard of it is a scary thing to them. And I, I want to take that fear away. There's no reason for it to have ever existed in the first place. Sure. That's a great point. Uh, the kind of education, the public education, um, not in the terms of public schools, but you know, letting people. Right, right. No, <laughs> yeah. Informing the masses. Yeah, absolutely. And so important because let's take, for example, a an industry that's often kind of lumped in. So you've got the AI guys and, you know, machine learning being kind of in that it's, it's the same sort of deal. Right. But with AI, the term AI has uh, a lot of movies. So people have an idea of what AI should be in their head and they're terrified of it. You know? Right. Um, and they actually have a lot of sort of, on the one hand, everybody knows what it is. On the other hand, nobody really has it right. And they have a lot of negative publicity to deal with. Um, but at least they have familiarity and they can say, well, actually, it's probably not going to be that your, your refrigerator starts attacking your whole family anytime soon. But until we get to that point, of course. 
versus like you said, most people, if you sit down at Christmas uh, dinner you know, with your family or something, they're not going to know what you're talking about. Or if they do like, Oh, you mean that scam in the news? <laughs> Hardest thing about my life is telling people what I do for a living. That's oh, well. very simple. And I'd love to be able to, 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 to tell people I work in blockchain and they say, blockchain, that's outstanding. I love blockchain. Tell me more <laughs> about it. I, I think it's fascinating. All I get are a bunch of perplexed looks and yeah, are, what are you doing? Are you scamming? Are you selling Bitcoins to people for a living? Uh, <laughs> no. Not at all. I missed that boat. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> right. So, you know, for people who are listening right now and they're looking for voices and insight they can trust in this space, is there anybody that you hold in such high regard that you would recommend them without hesitation? There are some, some, some basic books. I, I truly believe, um, I will say, uh, that mastering Bitcoin is a phenomenal place to start. And that of course, uh, Andreas, Andreas, uh, excuse me, Andreas, your last name's difficult sometimes, <laughs> but mastering Bitcoin. Um, when you when you listen to him speak, when you read his books, it's very much from a theoretical and um, how to implement that theory into practice. Uh, it's not, you know, there's no get rich quick. There's no technical analysis or fundamental analysis. It's very much um, technology and research based. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he has continued to keep his mindset there um, and not developed you know, Tim Draper, another individual that I admire, but um, he's, of course, a Bitcoin maximalist and has built Draper University and everything like that. And these are all wonderful things. However, a lot of it is very much for profit, um, not spreading the general knowledge of blockchain uh, technology to people. And I think Andreas does an amazing job of that. And, and he, to me, is someone who is you know, he stays out of the debates, he stays out of the, the, the four uh, situations and discussions. Of course, um, he's not, you know, on the core development teams of either of these. He's just simply, to me, a brilliant mind in the space, providing um, some unique insight without being um, financially or emotionally invested in either side of the projects or of the argument or whatever it is he's discussing. So he keeps a very even keel. Um, that comes to mind right offhand. Mm -hmm. Um, now, outside of Andreas, um, I'm sure there, there are others. I mean, I loved listening to Roger Ver five years ago when he was talking about how great Bitcoin was and when he, uh, when he was doing that. But, um, you know, guys, take it all with a grain of salt. There is no such thing as an industry expert. The industry has just hit 10 years of age. Bitcoin's birthday was what, 10, uh, turned 10, what, on Halloween this year? Mm. Yeah. Um, and by definition, um, an expert requires, uh, by, for if you're working a 40 hour work week, it takes 10 years to, to become an expert in your field, which is 40,000 hours. Um, by definition, there are no experts in blockchain because <laughs> you're just now hitting that 10 year, 10 year mark and Satoshi's not exactly come out and identified himself. Yeah. So take everything with a grain of salt, keep a very open mind and, try to empower yourself with as much knowledge as possible. It really helps you understand um, who is speaking um, out of confidence and uh, with knowledge and, and who is speaking out of confidence with thin air. Mm -hmm. And there's a very big uh, difference when you're able to discern the two of those um, in person or when you're listening to them over at a podcast or whatever the medium it might be. Absolutely. Uh, both very interesting characters. Um, the latter being far more uh, controversial. Uh, of of like course, <laughs> of course. And, and you know, and it, it's just, it, it's so interesting because you go back to, to, to his early days and he was not that controversial of a guy. He was just, he just really preached about Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so to see that transition has been a, uh, an interesting one. Again, of course, a controversial one, but fascinating as well. Yeah, well, particularly from your frame of reference with the community management, communications, uh, social media, being well aware of the power of sentiment moving virally through communities. Um, that is fascinating to watch. Somebody whose whole message was very positive for a long time, anti-bank, maybe anti-government, which was normal, very sure. normal back then. 
Um, Anarchists, yeah. everything like that. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there is that. And then I came back into paying more attention to all of this within the past year and had kind of mm-hmm. been for a couple of years. And I was like, wait, whatever happened to that guy? Uh, Roger right. Or something. And like, oh, wow, there's a lot of hate. There's a lot it's of hate. A change. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, change. It's fascinating. And for someone to have that much control uh, or social influence, I would say, um, yeah, like you said, from my perspective, it's, it's a very interesting individual to me. That, that, that's for sure. It's a case study in mass communication. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Another one, Elon Musk. No oh, yeah. Self. <laughs> boys and girls don't tweet about securing funding until you've spoken to the sec right yeah <laughs> or you know be be careful when you do smoke weed with joe rogan just you know, okay <laughs> god be bless careful you not televised <laughs> which everything joe rogan does seems to be so you know that's a fascinating example though i mean elon musk is a great example of one of those people who's kind of this figurehead that people put a lot of belief in. He's done some amazing things. I find it fascinating that he's got a cult of uh, personality around him. And at the same time, I find it really odd when people try to fling insults at it, like it's not valid because I'm really not all that invested in it either way. But there have been people saying, oh, look, Tesla's performing terribly from a financial perspective. What a jackass. I'm thinking, do you guys forget about reusable rockets <laughs> what happened <laughs> it, it's funny the visionaries of these of, of this world typically aren't uh appreciated until after their time and and we'll see he he may be proven crazy he may be proven to be one of the greatest geniuses that we've had the pleasure of spending time on this earth with but uh yeah. Either way, there's a lot of people out there like that, and there seem to be a lot of, you know, bring it back to blockchain. There seem to be a lot of amazing, incredible projects out there on the horizon, yeah. and I, th- I think, um, you know, the biggest, the biggest hesitation, the biggest holdup right now is that that questionable regulations and, and uh, yeah. the, with, from the SEC being seen as the authority uh, for many of these things. So. Mm-hmm. I'm very much looking forward to 2019, very much looking forward to seeing what the decisions, the regulations are going to be, how the industry is going to react, and more important, from my perspective, how the people are going to react to those decisions. Absolutely. You know, bringing it back to values and value, as we said, and the kind of um, things that we're going to see happen in 2019 as people get further along in the projects uh, that they started you know, technologically within the past couple of years or, or even further back and how those investments start shaping up for people and more importantly who's still around who's talking what they're saying so um you know i appreciate you sharing some some insight on who can be trusted or at least who should be given an ear uh, andreas antonopoulos is fascinating you know if you're listening right now and you haven't checked out just go search for a video of his and whether or not you agree with everything he says, it is definitely helpful to get grounded back in why any of this matters. You know, before the hype, it mattered for a lot of us. It mattered, right. This man is, uh, he takes the hype out of it all and explains to you why this is still important. And um, he still stands by those fundamentals, in my opinion. So Ben, tell us just one last good bit of your favorite uh, deal story. This is my favorite part of the show. So either negotiation, serendipity, good outcome, bad outcome, what's your favorite deal story and uh, what lessons should they take from it? Sure. So favorite deal story. We, um, I had the privilege, like I said, uh, we, we spoke earlier about my time uh, in Vietnam. I actually had the privilege of, of going back out there um, for an opportunity um, to work with um, to work with an individual on Vietnam's on several projects that they were doing uh, the crypto based one of which uh, is supply chain um, for their agricultural industry uh, a big issue over there is food control uh, mm-hmm. sourcing uh, food they want to keep it all internally in Vietnam you know the China to the north they don't exactly have the, the friendliest neighbors when it comes to food control and um, and they're very much um, anti uh, putting in any of the uh, chemicals or things that are going to cause, um, well, well, we don't know what they're going to cause. That's, that's why they're against it. So right. I was um, invited back by um, an investor in a project that I was on uh, prior to uh, <clears throat> prior to where I am now. 
And uh, this individual explained to me what his intent was. And we went out and built out a scope of, you know, how is this going to be accomplished? And it was fascinating. So, you know, it was really a true case study of a country for me, which um, was incredible because you think about a country like Vietnam, it's, it's, it's just a little sliver on a map, mm-hmm. but um, it's uh, got 96 or uh, 92 million people, I believe, in it, and 96 different provinces, which is the equivalent of a state. There's a governor of each province. Yeah. And the, the, so what is happening right now, what, uh, what I went out there to help spell out with them and, and really get it all ironed out is tokenizing the economy. So the, even the restaurants out there that you or I would go eat at as tourists, they're getting their food from the local market on a daily basis. And one thing, um, two things that are happening. One is spoilage. Uh, the farmers are bringing in far too much product because they don't know who needs what. Um, so they just bring more than what they need and it doesn't get purchased and it, it, it spoils. The other is quality control. And both of those can be are, um, solved on the blockchain. So this incredible project that's being built out right now, um, they're tokenizing the farms so you can actually when you buy a package of coffee from a from from the farm from the farmer's market you can you can scan the barcode on the back of that package and see where the bean came from what what province it came from and wow. follow its supply chain um or follow its journey on the blockchain all the way up into your hands as a consumer and it's it's making it more efficient for the farmers, they, they can put out their orders for what they have with their uh, current crop yield. And the buyers can then place their buys and the farmers only need to bring what they have. The deals are held in escrow through smart contracts and everything is executed out there in the market and it becomes a bit more of a cashless system, which is a big problem over there um, due to the the inflation. Um, yeah. People are having to carry around, you know, wads of bills just to buy a, a couple of you know, of drinks or some bread or whatever. Yeah. So to, to be able to tokenize this um, across a country that uh, many people believe to still be third world um, is just amazing um, because, you know, why build landlines when you can go ahead and just set up cell phone service everywhere? You know, right. that's, they're they're to me they're skipping the traditional route of opening up retail grocery stores and doing QA QC that way because they see that blockchain is 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 the next step. So they're just gonna go ahead and adopt the blockchain. Wow. So that to me was the most and has been the most fascinating deal I've ever been a part of because of the amount of good it's going to do for a country, not just a group of people or a, rather a small group, an entire country, perhaps even you know, helping them export their goods because they are certified, ver- you know, verifiably quality controlled substances on the blockchain. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, you know, I had no idea that they were actually implementing that. Uh, and I know uh, I was living there for three months recently. And what you mentioned about just the quality control, I mean, it's really hit or miss just even as a customer um, and carrying around like an obnoxious amount of cash. I mean, obnoxious. Post a joke, like, oh, look, I'm a millionaire. And it's like a few hundred bucks, whatever. That's it. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, you, you're thinking, oh, that's funny. But no, you put your wallet in your back pocket or even in your front pocket if you don't want to get pickpocketed, whatever. And you're carrying around this thing that won't close. And you feel obnoxious when you're trying to pay for things because you got four or five bills you, coming up. Yeah. You don't know how to count. You don't know how to do the, the, yeah, all the money. You're literally looking at a million dollar bill, wondering if that's what you need. To <laughs> so, um, and they're, yeah. they're going to deal with this. Um, interestingly, like you said, in, in a lot of these countries around the world, you see them jump the process so they can go directly to having the latest technology solutions without needing to go through the growing pains. And I think that's incredible. Um, how long ago was that? I mean, I know you went, this is this past year, right? That's actually in April of this year. Uh, excuse me, July. Uh, yeah, July. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Um, you know, are there any final words of wisdom you'd like to share with everybody listening right now? Um, well, to those of you listening right now, uh, you know, whether you're in blockchain, whether you're curious about it, you're in the industry, you're on the fence, um, 
stay with it, follow it. It's not going anywhere. Whether the price goes up or down uh, what, for a coin that you're following is irrelevant. Follow the technology, see where things are heading and, and keep your eyes out for some really amazing stuff in the future that you and I can't even probably fathom right now. And I, I think that uh, this mass adoption will be coming in 2019 and 2020. So don't worry about this bearish 2018. To me, it's a good thing. It's necessary with a shakeup that needed to happen. Stay strong and um, you know, follow what you believe in and continue to educate yourself and keep yourself safe, protected, and uh, following the right path of uh, this new blockchain future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and if they want to reach out and work with you or learn more about what you're working on, where can they find you? Sure. They can visit my website at leftventures.com and you can fill out a, a, an appointment right there. Uh, consults are free. We can speak about anything you've got, uh, anything you want to talk about under the sun. Happy to, happy to hear anyone's ideas anytime. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Ben. That's uh, Ben Leff at leftventures.com. You got it. Colton, thanks so much for having me today. It's a true pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Pendulum Insight Podcast. If you learned something today and you want to know more, go check out PendulumInsight.com.